Sandra Nomoto, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor. So let's let's begin by uh, you introducing yourself to to our audience. Uh, who who are you and how'd you get here? Sure. So uh, I will be five years vegan in April 2023. Um, although th that journey began long, long ago at the end of 2007 when I saw Earthlings. So that's a bit about my my vegan journey. Um, I consider myself Filipina Canadian. So uh, my parents immigrated to Montreal, Canada, where I was born, my sister and I, uh, and then we moved out west to Vancouver, uh, where I call home now. And professionally, I'm a content writer, marketing consultant, um, and I do a number of services for authors. Um, yeah, so been a communicator, I would say, most of my professional life. And, uh, and I'm, I'm a two-time author, so um, wrote my second book, published that in fall 2022, and uh, it's called Vegan Marketing Success Stories, the world's first vegan marketing book. So that's sort of my world now, um, writing, marketing, publishing books, um, whenever that, that can intersect with veganism, uh, that's great. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh -huh. a fan of integrating my own, my personal values into my work. I'm not new to that. So, um, yeah, so that brings us to, to here. All right. And so I, I have a copy of the book, Veganing Mar Vegan Marketing Success Stories, beautiful, beautiful cover, lots of, lots of veggies. Um, Thank you. <laughs> on, on the cover. And I want, to, I want to talk about that. And I also want to talk about it kind of in the context of, of lots of really interesting debates and discussions within the vegan community. And so mm -hmm. I guess I'll start with, like you said, it's the world's first vegan marketing book. And so let me ask the question, why does the world need a vegan marketing book? What, what's, what's been missing in all the marketing books that have been written so far that aren't, you know, completely appropriate for vegans? Great question. Um, yeah, there's there's a ton of marketing books out there, um, and I'm sure there are books with the same format that I used, which are sharing stories or sharing case studies. Um, but there didn't seem to be one that focused on the vegan industry. And not only that, when I did research in 2021 to see if you know what kind of vegan business books are out there, I only found one. <laughs> I only found Katrina Fox's Vegan Ventures, which she published around 2016. And uh, that and her book focuses on how to run a vegan business. And, and she has the same sort of, again, formula, case studies uh, of, of vegan businesses around the world. And she did have a few chapters about marketing. Um, but when I when I had read her book, um, yeah, she really inspired me because uh, that was sort of the, the formula that I was thinking for this book. And I could not believe there was only one vegan business book out there in the world. There, there are tons of vegan cookbooks, tons of books on why you should go vegan, but there seemed to be this huge gap in terms of just business and what is happening in the vegan industry. So I thought, hey, I'm going to write the second, <laughs> the mm. second vegan business book. And then this one, because of my background, I knew I wanted to really focus on marketing because even though I was, um, uh, so before I started the business I run now in, uh, which I started in 2020, uh, yeah, I was a living, you know, I was a vegan for about a year and a half and I've always been fascinated about, mar fascinated about marketing and about how businesses market themselves. So of course, as a new vegan, I I was paying more attention to what was happening in the vegan world and, and these businesses and, and, and how they market themselves. And so that's why I wanted to write this book to share that knowledge with others. Gotcha. So as a marketer, you know, there's lots of ways that we can look at gaps and needs. One of them is what you did. You looked at the the industry and like what it had to offer. And you saw there was only one book and it wasn't completely focused on marketing. But when you looked the other direction at the vegan community, what made you say, my goodness, these people could really use a hand? Well, yeah, and that's why I wanted to structure it in terms of here, here are stories of existing vegan businesses and case studies that, that share what they're doing that has helped them grow. Because if we want to build a vegan world, we need, we need industry. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's just no way about it. You know, much of our world runs on capitalism. And, and if we want to 
shift away from animal ag, um, you know, plant-based meat alternatives, things like that can help us make that transition um, to a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, and so I want, yeah, I wanted to share what these companies, some, of course, just a sliver of of the probably thousands of businesses out there, um, what they're doing that, that has helped them grow. And so that anybody who picks up this book can learn, can maybe learn, you know, a tip or two, if not more than that, <laughs> um, about what they can do to, to help them con- succeed because, uh, we need everybody. We need everybody in this movement, I believe. Mm-hmm. So, but what, what did you see in, in, when you looked at vegan businesses or people who wanted to start vegan businesses or people who had started vegan businesses that failed, what, what, did, what did you see that made you think these people need help? Were, like, were there common mistakes that folks were making? Well, <laughs> so this book is intentionally called Vegan Marketing Success Stories because I didn't really ask uh, these folks, uh, you know, did you fail or have you failed? Interestingly, after publishing the book, two of the contributing businesses, so two out of 47 contributors, and I have more companies that I included as examples, but two businesses have closed. And so interestingly, that doesn't mean that they're not successful. It just, you know, businesses close for for whatever reason. Um, But yeah, I really just wanted to focus on success stories. And so there really is only one failure to success story (laughs) that I share in the book. Um, Just because, yeah, that's the angle I wanted to take with it is, is what are you doing right now that is working for you? I believe another book, if we wanted to do, to talk more about why have certain vegan businesses failed, that could be another book. But yeah, I I didn't want this book to, to focus on that angle. Mm-hmm. So what what is it about a vegan business? I think there's probably a two-sided question. In what ways is it easier to market a vegan business and in what ways is it harder? Wow, what a great question. Um, you know, I, it, I find it hard to answer the first because every business is different. And of course, the, that, that applies to every business, not just vegan ones. Um, but I, I believe what could make it easier to market a vegan business is that shared value. So the reasons why you are vegan or you support vegan, you know, are, I would like to say altruistic, you know, we save animals, we're saving the environment, we're doing a a favor for our health, right? So, so these types of positive values, I would hope um, if a vegan business shares that, and that's a big part of their messaging that will hopefully resonate with, the audience that they are catering to. And that may, may not be exclusively vegan. They may just be omnivores who share these types of values. So that's, that's what I'll say on that front. Um, and I do find vegan businesses are, you know, it varies, of course, the amount of activism in, in, in their messaging. But I think that's, that's one thing that I found very common among the contributors and the examples in the book. Um, and then on the other side, um, yeah, there's that challenge of why should you switch from animal products to, to our products? So as, as I said before, with the, with the sharing of, of why our product, um, especially when it comes to food or fashion and something very obvious that we are currently using animals, uh, animal products as part of the industry, a normal part of the industry, um, they have to be a little bit more persuasive. It doesn't mean they have, they're using any different tools than any other conventional business, but that, that, um, that urge to be more persuasive, I think is there. So that, that's, mm-hmm. that's what I picked up from, from the book. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's fascinating because there's there, what you just said in terms of like, you know, shared values. So you could have a vegan business that's saying, I am going after vegans. Right. Like I'm going to put bunnies on the on the packaging. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to donate funds. I'm going to sponsor veg fest. I'm going to be out there. And what I want to do is sort of capture the existing vegan market heart and market share. And what we've seen, you know, the sort of the the um, the financial news about big companies like Impossible and Beyond was like, you know, their stocks like 
skyrocketed when they came out under perhaps this assumption like the whole world was going to go vegan or was going to hit 35 percent, a real tipping point. And now the financial um, press is vilifying them for not having grown enough, for, for just sort of ach achieving a stable thing and, and sort of not, you know, like not appealing to omnivores the way they thought they would. How, how do you think about that? Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm glad some time has passed since those, those headlines have come out because, of course, when you first look at it, you, your first thought is, well, we're not doing as well as we thought we were. But the truth is this, this is a long game, right? <laughs> Business is a long game. And so uh, I don't think we'll know whether these companies are truly successful until a few more decades have passed. I'll say that, first of all. Second, I think we also have to think about saturation in the market. Like beyond an impossible, we're very smart to, to come out in a big way and to market to omnivores. I don't believe, and, and I, I believe, yeah, part of the reason why both, none of them are in, in our, none of them contributed their stories to my book, I believe, is because they didn't want to be tagged as only for vegans. And I mm -hmm. think that's quite smart of them. They're not, they're not targeting vegans exclusively. They're tar targeting the omnivore who, as I said previously, may be just interested in their health and wants, want to eat more plants. So, um, I think they came out in a big way and now we have so many other, maybe smaller local companies trying to do the same thing. And now our market is, is saturated with things like, yeah, veggie beef patties. A lot of these products that have been around for decades, you know, uh, Tofurky, Eves, the, these are the, the, the OGs that, <laughs> that helped me on my journey, right? These have been around for a long time. And so I think that's another reason why you're seeing that decline, that financial decline right now is because the market is too saturated with these types of products and people, yeah, there just isn't enough. The demand isn't growing enough to sustain everyone. Um, that's what I believe. And um, I love following Jennifer Stoikovic at, at Vegan Women's Summit because she always responds to these headlines in such witty ways. She's much more intelligent than I am and, and much more tapped into the industry than I am. And she pointed out, look at the stocks of Meat companies, they're not doing so well either. <laughs> you know, everybody's mm. not doing so well in this economy. So it's not just that, hey, these plant based, you know, these big plant based public companies are failing. No, it's, it's just what's happening in the economy right now. And also, yeah, I think we have to look long term in terms of what we're offering to either the vegan market or omnivores to help them transition into becoming more plant based. Mm -hmm. So if someone were going to you know, start or really grow a, a vegan business and let's let's for the for the sake of argument, make it some sort of some food business. How how would you advise them to think about, am I going after the hardcore vegans or am I really kind of downplaying it and going after the omnivores and saying, like, this is a superior choice either for health or environmental impact or convenience or even price? How, how how does one make that decision? Because it sounds like the companies that have had the greatest success were the ones that decided one way or the other, as opposed to, to, to sort of muddling the messages. Yeah, great question. Um, I would advise a startup. Uh, yeah, you've got to have a primary audience, right? And so you do have to choose. Is that going to be vegans, which, by the way, are, on, are less than 5% of the world? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. That's a very niche market. And people have asked me, why are you creating a vegan book? You're, you're, you're niching yourself. Um, and, but I would say, I would advise most, most vegan startups, um, that it's a good idea to cater to omnivores. Why? Because we need to usher people along this journey. We need everybody. And so, if you want to target just vegans, there's nothing wrong with that. All the power to you. There are plenty of networks that can help you do that. And I think you can be really successful in that niche. But if you, if, if you want to use your business as activism and for positive change, which we really need in the world right now, catering to omnivores is a very good thing. And there are several, yeah, you know, <laughs> hundreds of ways to do that, as I point out in my book. Um, and also, how are you going to stand out? I would say that's, that's the, that's the key because we have so many vegan products already. 
Mm -hmm. uh, catering to omnivores, we got to find, you got to find that unique selling proposition that makes you stand out from any, from everybody else. And that's probably mm. something you'd say to any business, vegan or not, but especially in this, in this industry, that's how we, that's how we're going to grow and succeed. Right. It's interesting because, you know, you're talking about like, we're all going to grow this together. And yet part of the unique selling proposition, the USP is around differentiating and even like identifying who your competitors are. So all of a yep. sudden this touchy feely Kumbaya community are, are being asked by the forces of the marketplace and the forces of human psychology to say, here's how I'm different from this other company that I also love and want to succeed. How, how do you help um, business owners and marketers, you know, create a USP that, you know, that they're, they're, they are trying to win in a sense. And if it's the, the vegan world, there are going to be winners and losers, just like in any, any uh, ecosystem. Yeah. Well, I haven't had the opportunity yet to work with a startup that's that early. Most of the clients who come to me are already operating. And so it's, it's, it's more refining that message of how, how are you different? Um, but yeah, I, I think that would be such a fun challenge because <laughs> that's, that's the crux of marketing is figuring that, figuring that out and, and also being true to who you are, you know, figuring out what truly makes your product or service different. Because if it's not, then, then yeah, you're just competing with, with your peers, right? I like to, I, I, I like to call, you know, your competitors, your collaborators, because we're, we're all in this together. Um, but yeah, if you're not going to, if, if, if you can't find that differentiator, then, then you are just pitting yourself against your, your peer. Like I, I cannot name, there, there have been so many vegan, fo vegan, um, you know, faux leather accessory companies that have, that have popped up in the last few years. I, I, I wonder to myself, why, why do we need another one? You know, what is really different between hmm. the product you're making than what Matt and Nat has been doing for the last decade, maybe more. Right. I ask myself all the time, like, why, why do we need another one of these? Maybe, maybe it's geographical, you know, a company doesn't deliver in your area. And so, so it may be, beneficial to you to have a local, local, locally grown option. Um, but yeah, I think we're at the point now where we've, we're almost there where we've recruit, we've created alternatives for animals for almost everything. And so at this point, you know, either join one that's doing great, you know, maybe become apply to be an employee at one of these companies, or if you're going to start a company, it better damn well be a better option because we have so many out there already. Mm. So um, one of the one of the most influential marketing books that I read was Eugene Schwartz's Breakthrough Advertising, and he talked about the different phases of of a marketing campaign. Notice, and he used the example of toothpaste. That the first company that invented toothpaste, they had a monumental job. They had to convince people to brush their teeth. The second company that came out with toothpaste just had to say, "Try spearmint instead of peppermint." Mm -hmm. um, where do you, where do you think various segments of the vegan marketplace are at this point in terms of, you know, that that sort of like con consumer consciousness? And does it differ from from segment to segment from like, you know, cheese to burgers to frozen meals to leather to um, furs and all that? Yeah, I, I think we're not too different in the conventional example you just gave. Uh, in, it's sort of both where we have all the, all, we have all the options out there for you to become vegan, but we have to teach you how to brush your teeth, right? <laughs> we have to get you away from animal consuming animal products into the, trying this, um, plant-based alternative. You may not like it, but there's, there's so many more others you can try <laughs> if you don't like this one. And then as you pointed out, yeah between one toothpaste brand and the other, yet we've got so many food alternatives. Uh, we've got so many fashion alternatives. Um, I think there are some other segments where maybe there aren't too many options out there yet, but, um, but yeah, I think we're at the point now where we've got, we've got enough of the, the choices, at least if you're in the West, um, you know, there are e-commerce companies that can deliver, you know, across the continent. Right. So um, we can get these things at our fingertips, if not, at, at the grocery store. So uh, yeah, I think it's twofold. 
we need to, we need to to get the the non vegans on board or the pre vegans, and then for the for those folks who are already, um, I think vegetarians are a great example. So vegetarians have already committed to to not eating meat and seafood. Maybe they're eating still eating eggs and and uh, and dairy products. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've got a friend who's you know I can't give up cheese. I can't find a vegan cheese brand that I like that tastes like the real thing. Mm-hmm. And so I, it, you know, if I had this conversation with her again, this is years ago, I'd say, have you tried this? Have you tried that? <laughs> I, I just keep pitching the brands and just say, try, you know, keep trying the different, the different options that you have, because there's got to be one that will help that will then say, okay, I can make the switch and, and mm-hmm. move a little bit more along, um, that plant-based spectrum. Right. That's interesting. I saw an article just in the last week. Um, I can't remember where, but it was basically that vegetarians are now feeling bullied. <laughs> like, you know, mm-hmm. that they're not good enough. That there's, now they feel like from the, from the V, you know, they used to feel bullied from the meat eaters, but now they're feeling more bullied by the vegans. Like they go to restaurants and there's no more vegetarian options. It's either meat or totally vegan. Um, it seems like there's an inter- sort of an interesting um, dance of, and I see this a lot in sort of vegan and plant-based world where it's a big tent, but everyone's trying to define themselves against somebody else and it can get kind of rancorous. How, how do you recommend that vegans talk to vegetarians who are like, you know what, I'm fine with what I'm doing. I'm fine with not killing, but I want to eat eggs and cheese. Yeah. Um... So uh, I, yeah, I come across this all the time on social media is, is, is there's, there's the bully vegans and, and there's, I like to, I, I would hope I put myself in the, in the boat where, um, we celebrate every, you know, every good effort you're making, because that's where I was, you know, not too long ago. Um, I was for many years pescatarian and everybody was calling me a vegetarian, even though I still eat seafood. Um, <laughs> just because we have these labels out there, right. And, and not everybody knows what it, what it means. And then when I was finally vegetarian and, and, you know, I didn't know I was, I was, I was only going to be there in, for about a year before I fully went vegan, but it was, it was an, a local influencer in town who, um, I've, you know, stayed in touch with on social media and kept following. And she's so great at posting about what happens to dairy cows and mm-hmm. their calves. And she just kept posting, you, you know, not saying, you know, go, you know, everybody should go vegan. And, and this is why you should stop eating dairy. She would just continue to post. This is what happens. And she would tell me, um, like, oh, are you, st- are you still, you know, still eating dairy? She would ask me the question. And I, w- and because of that, just continual, um, reminder, uh, that's, yeah, that's, that helped me kept, help me keep, um, veganism as my North, my North star. I knew I was, I, I wanted to reach that, that point. And, um, if I had been bullied by some sort of vegan telling me I'm a horrible person, which, and I see so much of this happening, I, I might, I might not have ever gotten there. So, um, I think the approach, the better approach is, is continual encouragement and reminding of what happens to these, to these animals in the, in the dairy and poultry industry. Um, yeah. And we can't vilify, you know, someone for, for eating at A and W eating a beyond burger at A and W just because it's, it's cooked on the same grill as, as the meat, you know, thing, things, things mm-hmm. like that. I think, um, yeah, we just, we just need to gently usher people along where we can. Mm-hmm. So, so how, how do you um, advise vegans to think about large companies that are not vegan, that are sort of you know, conventional companies who might then see a vegan company do well and then sort of jump in and cannibalize it? Um, you know, whether whether it's, you know, like Dean Foods, com- you know, either buying s- silk or, or just coming up with another alternative. I'm thinking back about nine years, I was helping uh, Purple Carrot launch. They're a, uh, uh, you know, plant, they were the first plant-based meal kit, like after, you know, Blue Apron and Hello Fresh and a couple of those really hit it big. Um, a friend of mine got the idea, let's do a vegan version. And oops, I forgot to turn off my phone. Um, 
a, you know, a, ve a vegan version of it and then was worried that, you know, one of these giant companies could just very easily say, OK, here's a plant based line. And, we, you know, having all the R&D behind it and having the existing distribution. How do you help vegans think about, OK, I'm going to create something that's going to be good and then it's just going, you know, someone else is going to come in and, and reap all the rewards and I won't be able to compete. I just think back to how can we create a marketing campaign around that? <laughs> like if you yeah. see the competitor coming from a mile away, that's when you got to start differentiating again and being like, hey, you know, we're one of the OGs. We've been out there for a long time. We're vegan owned. I would capitalize on that. You know, we we we've been around for this reason. Um yeah, and and you know we welcome other 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 folks coming in and creating more vegan meals for everyone. Um, but this is this is how we've operated. That's you know among other things, I would start there and and really, and that's why storytelling is so important. Is is the more people get to know you and your backstory, the more loyal followers you're going to have, hopefully in the long run, right? So that if a big competitor like that comes along. Maybe they'll try it once, but they're not, they're going to stick with you because you've been around longer and they know you and they know your story and, and your values and what you're about. So I think that, yeah, you know, we could create a whole podcast around, uh, around that and what we would do to help that, that company. But, um, that's, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So I love that you're focusing on sort of storytelling and, you know, the human aspects of business, because I think so many people, good people have been brought up to think that, you know, people is people and business is business. And there really isn't much of an intersection and that business has to be all about, you know, following the rules or, or, or you know, cutthroat practices. And they don't see this, this tremendous um, body of resources that they have in terms of just their own, uh, their own story, their own personality, their own passions. And it's weird because all of us can, everyone connects with a company that we like in terms of a personality. Like, you know, if I ever have a choice of buying something around, you know, outdoor clothing or camping or something, I'm always going to choose Patagonia because of the story in my mind about who they are and what they care about. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find it hard to convince vegan business owners to kind of open up a little bit and become you know, vulnerable and, be, and, and, and become personable? I think that's a, that's a good rule for every business um, and especially vegan businesses if we want them to succeed. Um, and, and that's the reason why, you know, I do, I, 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 I talk and I use videos in my Instagram reels. I just recently hopped on TikTok. I, I held off for a very long time. <laughs> and it's actually not as scary as, as, as you think. It's, it's exactly like Instagram reels. That's what it was. That's what reels were, were modeled on. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't hop on those because I love seeing my face. I, I, I do that because I know that this is how I connect with people. People want to see my face and hear my voice and just, you know, can I, would I jive with her if she's going to write for my company? Right. So, um, I think this, this, um, yeah, this kind of era that we're in where we have these tools where we can show our faces and tell our stories a lot easier than when we only had billboards and traditional media. Um, yeah, there's, there's really no excuse why you can't tell your story anymore and you can't use these tools. Like, and as we talked about right at the start, there there's almost there's already so many companies probably doing what you're doing, right? Unless you invent the new iPhone or whatever it is, the, unless you invent a new product or service that doesn't already exist, you're competing against um, somebody else that's already done it. And so, by telling your own story and sharing your values. That's how you're going to differentiate yourself and why somebody might want to choose you versus the existing option. Um, and yeah, and I give a lot of those examples in the book. Um, it's, it's a strategy that Midday Squares in Montreal uses very well. They document absolutely everything that's happening in their company, including what's, what's going wrong. Um, same thing with Kelly Bennett, creative director out in New York City. Uh, she's, yeah, she, she sort of, she walks her, her talk. Uh, she, this is this is a strategy she gives her clients and she does it herself. So, um, yeah, 
I think I went on for a bit too long there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's all right. Is, um, so you talked about, you know, um, products, but also as a service uh, company. Is there a difference in how, a, you know, like someone like you who um, provide a service, like you don't like if I'm eating a burger, it's a big difference whether it's a meat burger or a vegan burger. If someone's writing for me at some level, they could both produce the same thing. I don't need a vegan to be able to write for vegans necessarily. So it's it's more it's a little bit more nuanced. What um, what do you advise or what do you do yourself to to be the vegan who provides a service that really anybody anybody theoretically could provide? Yeah, so so I started my business right off the bat labeling myself as a vegan. I started out as the vegan copywriter and <laughs> and uh I was very very lucky to to attract my first few clients. And I wasn't uh, initially I didn't um look to specialize in only vegan businesses. It just turned out that in my first 2 years all of my clients were vegan. So I then made the the commitment that um, on the business side, at least on the content marketing side, all of my clients uh, are going to be vegan. So that's a stance that I've made. Hopefully that differentiates me a little bit from from any other copywriter. And second, um, I actually went the other way and dropped the vegan from my title <laughs> because I had a previous client in um, the PR business that I used to run. Um, you know, we had done a lot of copy editing work together and I, I you know, I told her, hey, I'm, I'm starting a new business. I'm, I'm focusing more on writing and editing. Um, you know, if you ever need any help. And she said, yes, but do I need to be vegan to work with you? And that's when I realized hmm. having that V word in my title might actually be working against me because even though that would be fa fantastic to work with other vegans, um, for me, it's mostly so long as your business, uh, is not involved in, in, um, involving animals or cruelty to, to people or the environment in, a, in an obvious way. That's my criteria. So I actually rebranded to the content doctor so that the front facing, you know, it, it looks like I work with everyone. But when you land on my site and hopefully look at my social content, you'll see that veganism is a very big part of my life and my work. And hopefully that'll differentiate me from any other copywriter. So, so that's what I've used just in my own strategy. And hopefully, um, yeah, when it comes to service-based business businesses, um, there, there are some examples in my book. Um, yeah, they found ways to, to either use that V word, um, or just the fact that they're the only, like, for example, vegan pest control, uh, company in the UK that doesn't harm animals. <laughs> um, so I'm talking about Kevin at, at Humane Wildlife Solutions. That's 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 a USP nobody else in the UK could take, at least up until, you know, whenever that next person comes along. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, there's something really nice about, um, you know, that, a kind of marketing message that makes people shake their heads and think, how can that be, right? Because that you know, marketing in the in in our world is, is largely about attention at first. Like the first thing we've got to do is get attention before we can even begin to explain anything. And so to say something that sounds like an oxymoron or like two things that couldn't go together necessarily, like vegan pest control, right, is it immediately breaks through the, you know, the clutter and noise of everybody saying the same thing. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I, I I I was just at a, a networking meetup last week, and I brought a couple books, uh, um, you know, if people wanted to buy it. And of course, this is this this is not a vegan meetup. It's you know, I think I was the only vegan who happened to be there, and I still I had one fellow come up to me and ask me, "What is vegan?" We're starting right from square one there. <laughs> I had mm. to define what vegan means, and then and then go on to say, "Here's the difference between my book and all the other marketing books." So. Um, yeah, you know, as a vegan, you got to be prepared to, to, to even start from that square one. What is, what is veganism? Because people mm. still don't know. Mm. So, which, which brings me to another point. So, you know, your, your book is full of sort of like strategies and examples from direct marketing to events, to PR, to digital strategies, you know, coupons, giveaways. The, the, the essence of marketing is understanding what people want 
in understanding how they want to be talked to. I thought what, one of the hardest things for for anyone who's who is um, values based is to not preach their values. Right. So, you know, so I, I learned very early on, like, don't fall in love with your product, like, which is to, to say, mm. don't assume that you've got something. It's so great. You love it so much that other people are going to love it. How, how do you suggest that people who want to start or grow a vegan business balance their own? This is what I believe and this is what I know with the humility to ask the market, like, how do you want it? What do you want? How do you know what's important to you? Yeah, great question. And I think the first thing that comes to mind is is market research, right? I, I didn't mean to write a chapter one marketing basics chapter, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, just ideas started coming and I realized, you know, these are not tactics. Chapters two through six talk all about tactics, but I realized, you know, starting from, yeah, st starting from the beginning and really figuring out Am I providing a product or service that really needs to be out there? I, I think, again, as we've discussed, there's so many alternatives out there now. You really got to ask, do I need to create another one? Am I doing it better than something that already exists? Because if not, then why don't you just join them, right? Um, and that's where I think market research ex is, uh, yeah, that's where you'll find out maybe the audience you thought was going to consume your product or service is some, is someone else. Um, and then that's who you're going to talk to. Um, or you, you may need to tweak your product or service, um, you know, that you thought you were going to launch because it needs to be a little bit different, um, compared to what's out there. So I think that's where you can answer some of those questions before you launch and spend a lot of money, uh, launching in the marketplace and then only to find out it, people don't need it or they've already got a solution. Um, I think, yeah, if we come at, if we think about business and, and, and starting business as problem solving, um, truly, yeah. If you're solving a problem that isn't already being tackled, I think you've got something there, but there's just, yeah, there's so many, offerings already out there. And so you really have to figure out how you're different. Right. Well, there's another danger, though, in which you can solve a problem that people need to have solved, but they don't want it. Or they don't want to pay for <laughs> it. Right. So so especially, you know, in say a vegan world or where I, you know, I'm more in the health based space. Um, you know, I co-founded a company, Well Start Health, that we were going to use plant based nutrition and lifestyle medicine coaching to slash companies' healthcare costs, right? Such a no-brainer, right? Instead of spending all the money on drugs and surgeries after people get disease, we're going to teach them not to get the disease in the first place. Who could possibly think that wasn't a brilliant idea? And, you know, we've been dead for two years <laughs> because the market wasn't, you know, my story is the market wasn't ready for it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there have been plenty of vegan companies or vegan restaurants or pop ups or food food brands that believe and maybe they're right that the market wasn't ready for it. How do you help people distinguish between like, I know people need this and but is anybody actually going to write a check? Yeah, I don't know if I have the answer for that. And I, I agree with you. I think in some cases, it, the time it really depends on timing. Um, I think one of the reasons why, you know, we've talked about Beyond Meat and Impossible, these big guys coming out the way that they did. Um, I think part of the reason why they're so successful is because there was no, you know, competitor for a long time. Um, you know, Tofurky, Eves, etc. these guys have been around for a long time, but are already in the, uh, yeah, they've already got vegans as fans. But they're not maybe they weren't necessarily marketing to the omnivore, whereas that's the strategy Beyond took, and that, and it it really took off for them. So, um, yeah, I think timing uh, sometimes has has something to do with it, and and what's hap yeah what's happening kind kind of economically, culturally, 
um, when people, yeah, feel that there's a need for something and then a company comes out, launches and provides that solution and it takes off, I think, yeah, sometimes there's that. So yeah, I don't know if I can answer that properly. <laughs> sometimes it's up right. to fate and, and the market. Right. Well, I mean, it does, it does seem like the world is changing on two very, on two very different tracks that you're, um, that you're, you know, running on. One is the world of marketing, obviously, where I don't, I don't know about you, but when I, when I was writing a book on digital marketing in about 20, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I, the, the editor had to wrest the manuscript from my hand because I kept saying, wait, no, there's something new. Yeah. I need to, I need to include this. <laughs> right. And so there's that one area where this constantly accelerating and changing advice. And then there's the culture itself around meat, the conversations around food. Um, like how, how hard was it to like hand in the manuscript and say, okay, it's done for now, even though 20% of it is going to be, you know, obsolete soon. Yeah, I mean, I had a timeline that I was trying to work toward, you know, launching the book in November, World World Vegan Day, uh, 2022. And so I just, yeah, I just had to decide, okay, it's done. <laughs> and then, mm -hmm. and then give the manuscript to my editor, because otherwise, yeah, you can, you can just keep going when it comes to marketing. And I even had somebody who I approached to submit a story. And she said, well, by the time it comes out, it's already going to be outdated which is a fair judgment, you know, marketing yeah. moves extremely fast. And as, as I said, two of these contributors have already closed businesses. So, um, yeah, I absolutely agree. It's, 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 it's tough writing a, a marketing book, but <laughs> I, I'm giving you a glimpse into what people have used in 2021 and 2022. That's what I, that's what I'll say for the next five years. Right. And, um, so, you know, you, you obviously work for money. You help people with their with their marketing, with with PR, with writing, things like that. There's lots of things in the book, strategies that are you know people would pay for. If someone's starting out and they're they're pretty small and they don't really have a budget, are there things that people can do, or even that, that they should be doing themselves and not outsourcing around their marketing when they're just getting started? Yeah, I I always like to look at the four basics when I start with clients. Number one, your website. It surprises me, you know, people run businesses only on Instagram. They don't have a website and that might work for you for some time. But if Meta ever goes down or if Instagram goes down for a day, that's your business. And so you all, you got to have a website. That's your digital home. That's what I recommend. Number two, an email list. Um, yeah, just so that you, again, have a way of contacting your audience, you own that audience um, and have, a, yeah, have a way to reach them if another, if a platform goes down or your website is under construction. Uh, number three, um, have a blog. And I know that doesn't sound very exciting, but uh, that's how you tell stories. That's how you add content, text content to your website and get found by search engines like Google. Um, and number four, social media, because that's a, you know, free or low cost, uh, way to reach different audiences. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, and tell your story. And, and, and I look at all those, the four basics, oftentimes there's something that we can improve upon, upon before we even start looking at other tactics. So, you know, making sure you're blogging regularly, if you aren't sending out emails on somewhat of a regular basis, if you're not already. Um, and then from there, you can always layer on, you know, a plenty of other tactics that are out there, whether free or paid. So those are the four basics that I always like to look at with clients. Gotcha. So one thing I'm curious to talk to you about is you, you introduced yourself as a Filipino Canadian. Um, veganism to me has always looked very white until pretty recently. Um, is, you know, is that, is that simply, you know, unfortunate smart marketing or is, is that really like dismissing a huge potential for, for growth and community and, and engagement? I don't know if it intentionally started out as marketing. Um, I haven't been vegan long enough to have seen what, <laughs> the, you know, what was happening pre-social media, but I think um, 
for, yeah, from what I've seen in my journey, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's almost 12 years now, um, very much of it has been white. And, and if you look at all of the vegan influencers who are getting paid to um, showcase certain products or services, a lot of them are white. They're skinny white women, they're muscular white men, uh, lifting weights. And I, you know, there's, there's a place for that. Um, but it's definitely not the only place. And, and the reason why I'm here talking to you, I'm not, I'm not extroverted. (laughs) Um, but, but I want to, but I realize I am the face of potentially an Asian female who might be thinking about transitioning. And I want to tell those, those folks that we need you. Um, and I'm really excited about all of the, the media attention that has come to um, folks like Tabitha Brown, um, who's, you know, as we're, we're, we're recording this, she recently launched a whole line of under $8 products at Target. That is amazing. I, I wish I lived in the States to be able to access a Target. Um, people like her, people like Genesis Butler, um, you know, teenage vegan activist who's who's been... Um, yeah, speaking on TEDx stages since she was 14. Um, yeah, just just so many other uh, influencers who are representing that, not only that Black community, but communities of color. And that's, that's also why I, I included a section about diversity and inclusion in my book is because I wanted to to point out to anyone who's reading the, the book, vegan or not, that we need everybody in this movement. And so... If you're doing, you know, a campaign where you're hiring models and taking an editor, doing an editorial photo shoot, consider hiring some some people of color because because not everybody's white who you need in this movement. So I thank you for for just asking that question. Mm. So do you, as we come come to a close, you have lots of stories in the book. What are what are just a couple of your favorites? Just to sort of like inspire and and help people think maybe out of the box in terms of their marketing. Yeah, I, run, I mentioned a couple of examples already. Um, the one that I, I just am really honored to to have included is is uh, that of Meredith Marin at Vegan Hospitality. So before even founding Vegan Hospitality, she relocated to Aruba, the Caribbean island of Aruba. Uh, this was back in 2016 where her husband is um, and her husband is originally from there. And she found herself not w- w- without very many options there uh, at restaurants or even in the grocery store. And she just took it upon herself to, um, first of all, she started the hashtag and social accounts for vegan Aruba, which digitally I think was effing brilliant. <laughs> she started there um, to, yeah, so that she could sort of, rally this community of travelers who might be coming to the island and just really not finding options for themselves. And she went to every vegan restaurant she could and said, hey, talk to the chefs and said, can you make some vegan dishes for me? And they went, well, where are we going to get our produce and such? And then and then started a whole, uh, you know, supply chain (laughs) around bringing what they needed to the island, which then populated the grocery stores. She's really amazing. She like, yeah, so she spoke um, both in the media and and wherever she could about the importance of veganism. And then because of all of the press that she got on the island, um, got to partner with the Aruba Tourism Authority to sponsor an influencer trip. So they brought over six influencers, um, I believe mostly from the U.S., uh, vegan influencers, showed them a good time. And some of that content from 2018 is still top ranking when you when you Google vegan and Aruba. Um, so she almost single-handedly um, made this island uh, the most vegan-friendly island in the Caribbean, according to Happy Cow. So Happy Cow is the app that tracks all of this. Um, and her company now, Vegan Hospitality, teaches people how to do exactly that in the areas where they may, may be living and working. So her story is just um, an incredible example of you don't even need a team around you. You know what I mean? You just need to be mm-hmm. savvy and smart and start where you can. And over a number of years, look what might happen. And that's how we build a vegan world. So i um, super stoked to have shared her story. Um, do you want another one or is that good enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe two more and then we'll, we'll, then we'll say goodbye. Sure. Um, so Goddess Garden is an American um, 
skincare and, and uh, beauty company, uh, very well known for their organic sunscreen. And so the CEO, Nova Covington, found herself doing a lot of this advocacy work in terms of educating people on why you should buy, you know, sunscreens without chemicals. And she started this uh, reef safe campaign in Hawaii, um, you know, and approached other sunscreen companies. She was, she, their products weren't even selling in Hawaii and, and nobody wanted to get on board to uh, petition to ban these two particular chemicals that are, have been proven to be damaging to coral out there mm. in Hawaii. So it was really Goddess Garden that created this entire campaign. I believe they started in 2015 and it, it lasted three years. So over the course of these few years, um, they got, uh, yeah, a ton, a ton of media coverage, um, almost 60,000 sig signatures, I believe, in the petition. And so when the governor of Hawaii finally, you know, decided to implement this ban, invited them to, to come and celebrate that in Hawaii, uh, he said, oh, so you're the woman who crashed our servers. <laughs> so that was yeah. really, really cool to hear that, uh, yeah, over the course of a, of a few years, Goddess Garden really, really took it upon themselves to um, not just, you know, create a great marketing campaign, but really um, have an effect, a positive effect um, on, on, on Hawaii. And I, I know there's other chemicals that are probably damaging, but, you know, to at least ban the two that are predominantly in sunscreen is, is huge. Um, right. And just, just to last... reflect on that before, we, before, we, before you think of the third one is there's, you know, one, one of the things that bothered me the most when I was doing marketing was there were all these techniques that would be good for the marketer and bad for the world in that, you know, mm. they'd work on some psychological level, but they would basically erode the trust in the commons, like a little, a little lie or a little greenwashing or, so, or something like that, that, that you heard, you know, as a, cust as a consumer, you'd hear it again and again and again, and you'd gradually weary of the whole thing. And one of the most common was the company was using a message essentially to make more money. They're like, you know, they, they get together, the strategists would say, okay, so how do we increase market share? Oh, there's a group of people over there who care about that. There's a bunch of moms who are worried about SIDS. There's a bunch of, you know, people near the coast who are worried about erosion. Let's jump on that and use it. And one of the things that I find really refreshing about many of the vegan businesses I know um, and the vegan business people and the entrepreneurs is that for them, the whole purpose of the business was to push the movement as opposed to the other way around. Um, and, I, and, you know, I'm wondering, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how vegan businesses can communicate that, that, that the money isn't the bottom line, the changing the world is the bottom line. I think about someone like Miyoko Shinner from, you know, Miyoko's Creamery, mm -hmm. as someone who's, you know, very, very outspoken on LinkedIn and publicly about, you know, I did this thing. It didn't. It worked for the business, but I'm not. It didn't help the movement, and I want to stop doing it. Or, um, you know, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if you if you've seen that sort of uh, a flipping of the script, whereby the business becomes a means to a social good, as opposed to the social good becoming a, a kimono to hide the business's dirty bits. Oh, I've I've certainly seen that for a long time. So. The PR business that I used to run, um, you know, I was running in a lot of B Corp circles, 1% for the planet, you know, any of these sort of groups that I could hang out with, <laughs> um, I did <laughs> just to, to learn from them. And also, um, yeah, I've, I've learned that these folks like that have been sharing those stories for a long time. You know, Patty Agonia, we've mentioned, is a great example. Um, but in the vegan world, I think we're starting to see more of that, and we definitely need to, because otherwise, non-vegans are going to see us just like everybody else. They're just trying to make money. So we do have to share these stories. Um, and yeah, Miyoko's a great example. Um, Jennifer Stoikovich, again, at Vegan Women's Summit, same thing. They, they're... they're yeah, they, they are more activists, I would say, than they are. I mean, they're brilliant business people as well. But uh, but yeah, that's that's a side I love to see. And, and, and that's different, too. And both 
both happen to be women, you know, interestingly. So, um, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I think that's, uh, yeah, I'm starting to see more of that. And I think we, we do need more. Um, yeah. Right. So, 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 and yeah, you're running for the last example, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's do, let's do from, one more. From the book. Um, so yeah, one I, I really enjoy is is this in the UK, which hasn't been around for, for too, too long, but they've really capitalized on the publicity stunt and also um, showing social proof that non-vegans cannot tell the difference between meat products and plant-based products. And so hmm. um, the two examples that I share in the book, you know, they the, the one that I believe they launched with was, you know, at a fake restaurant where they invited, you know, 25 of London's hot, you know, top food critics and bloggers. They didn't tell them what they were going to eat. They had a Michelin star chef there, you know, who would pretend to make the meals. You know, they had hidden cameras everywhere and then served them a meal. And then the told, told them at the end, you know, after they had already said, yeah, this was great. I love the texture of the chicken and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, that you, you've just eaten a plant-based meal. And so I love that strategy. Um, and then they did the same thing at the, um, a similar thing at the European pizza and pasta show in, um, 2021, where they created a fake, uh, Italian sausage company <laughs> and, uh, handed it, handed them out to the passersby who thought they were eating real sausage and then revealed at the end, uh, uh, nope, you just eat a, ve a veggie virgin. And I love, yeah, I just love those initial pure reactions of what this isn't me because it shows you that we can compete and that you do not need to eat meat to get that same great taste or texture. So, um, yeah, really a, a big fan of what this has done and can't wait to look at the next stunt that they pull. Hmm. So yeah, I'm, he I'm hearing a theme of sort of positivity and playfulness, you know, yes. whether it's, it's this or, um, you know, slutty vegan, yeah. Um, which you mentioned in, in the book, um, you know, just that there's there's so much about being vegan that involves looking at horrible things and, you know, like being willing to look at things that most people are not. And that can be scarring. And then to be able yeah. to metabolize that, turn it around and say, OK, this is like we can make a better world. Let's look at the future. Let's look at what's possible. Let's look at the alternatives and let's have fun instead of, you know, the doom and gloom. It's, that would just, you know, feel so natural to us. So I, I love that you're bringing together these stories and you're pointing people in this direction. Thank you. And I absolutely agree. We need more playfulness and more fun and more, um, I think, heart is a natural part of veganism. But yeah, the more that we can make it light and just show that we're having fun and having a party over here and saying, come on, come along. You, you don't need to eat animals or consume animals to 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 have fun. I think, yeah, we, we need more of that. Um, and there's, there's definitely a place for the dark documentaries and the footage. Um, you know, that's what got me, <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, the more that we can say, yeah, we're, we're having fun and living life just, you know, in a more ethical and compassionate way is, is, is an important part of how we shift people's mindsets. So thank you for mentioning that. Right on. So say, say your book name again, so many people have it in their heads, and also a website where folks can find you and follow you. Yep, Vegan Marketing Success Stories, and it's available in all formats. But uh, if you hop onto my website, just with my name, sandranimoto.com, over on my products page, I'll, I'll have all those links for you. Excellent. So Sandra, thank you so much for writing this book for supporting all the people and all the movements that you support and for taking the time today. It was such a pleasure. Thanks so much, Howie.